Good evening. There has been a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union, and the Soviets have admitted that it happened. The Soviet version is this. One of the atomic reactors at the Chernobyl atomic power plant near the city of Kiev was damaged. There is speculation that the leak there, that people were injured and may have died. As a kid, I always wondered what the world would look like if we suddenly left. There was something exciting about the thought of buildings slowly crumbling and being covered in plants, and something exciting about the thought of nature returning to an area from which it had been banished. It's clearly not just me. Humans have been fascinated about this for centuries, and it's very present in pop culture's obsession with post-apocalyptic movies, books, our fascination with abandoned places, and also all the video games that have been coming out on the subject. This is one of the many thoughts which attracts me to rewilding, the nature restoration movement that aims to go beyond conservation and bring nature back to areas from which it has disappeared entirely. Rewilding is all about letting nature do its thing. It's about allowing natural processes to resume with the least amount of human intervention possible, besides a little helping hand here or there to sort of get things on their way. For the most part, we have to be content with a few small changes, with improving the landscape a little bit, just to become a little bit more nature friendly. And we never really get to see this drastic transformation of the landscape itself. And, uh, this is mostly because humans are still there, which is obviously a good thing, by the way. I'm happy that we are still here. Um, but we never get to see this big transformation in one go. But the curiosity remains. What would things look like if humans were to suddenly pack up and leave? What would nature do with such an opportunity? This is where Chernobyl comes in. It's the perfect example of extreme rewilding. Humans are kept out by radiation, and this gives wildlife an opportunity to recolonize the area and bring back its original ecosystem. Now, before we get started talking about Chernobyl, uh, I just want to make clear that this is the worst nuclear accident in the history of mankind. Countless people died, uh, many more suffered horrendous injuries from it, so we are in no way supporting this or saying it's a, a good thing in some way, it was a horrible thing. We're very much against the accident, unhappy that it ever occurred. But it does provide us with an interesting opportunity to analyze something fascinating. Now that that is out of the way, here's a quick recap of what happened in Chernobyl. The Chernobyl disaster was a nuclear accident that occurred on the 26th of April, 1986 whilst conducting a test on the number 4 reactor in the Chernobyl nuclear power plant near the city of Pripyat in the north of the Ukrainian SSR. There are countless documentaries and a very acclaimed show that cover the subject, so I won't attempt to provide commentary on the accident itself. It's the long-term consequences that are of interest to us here. Long story short, the accident led to widespread radioactive contamination which led to the creation of an exclusion zone around the nuclear reactor. This area spans 30 kilometers in all directions from the reactor, covering an area of about 4,200 square kilometers. And it's very uninhabited, as you can imagine. There's about 200 people living there, and they're only at the edges of the exclusion zone. About 70% of the exclusion zone is forest. The monoculture pine plantations that were there in 1986 have now given way to more diverse primary forests. Although 200 square kilometers of it burned up in 2020, which is a big shame and was obviously a big scare for all of us. Nobody likes to hear about fires next to nuclear reactors. Local conservationists though expect the area to be mostly recovered within 10 years. So what about the wildlife? The Chernobyl exclusion zone supports a wide variety of species, including grey wolves, Eurasian lynx, brown bear, black storks, European bison, roe deer and boar. And studies have shown that high doses of radiation during the first six months after the accident significantly affected animal health and reproduction. However, any potential long-term radiation damage to populations is not apparent from the observed trend in the population data. In fact, the authors go on to state that relative abundances of elk, 
roe deer, red deer, and wild boar within the Chernobyl exclusion zone are similar to those in four uncontaminated nature reserves in the region, and that wolf abundance is more than seven times higher. These results demonstrate that, regardless of potential radiation effects on individual animals, the Chernobyl exclusion zone supports an abundant mammal community after nearly three decades of chronic radiation exposure. The nature reserves they used for comparison in this study all had relatively smaller sizes, ranging from about a fourth of the exclusion zone to about half of the exclusion zone. Also, these areas have much higher population densities for rather obvious reasons as uh, there is no radiation there and there are quite a few villages within their boundaries. So what can we conclude from all this? A sad first conclusion is that even radiation is not as detrimental to wild ecosystems as the good old homo sapiens. The pressure we put on wild ecosystems is simply devastating. Our second conclusion has to be that nature really has this capacity to bounce back and do so rather quickly when we give it the space to do so. Finally, in more practical terms, our comparison with the other four reserves gives us a few hints of what we need to put in place to allow wilderness to thrive. The exclusion zone has similar wildlife population densities to the other four reserves. However, what stands out is the wolf and lynx population densities. You see, large predators are a great indicator of a healthy, self-sustaining wild ecosystem. So what does the exclusion zone have that other areas don't? And no, it's not the radiation. Wolves and lynx are not attracted to the radiation. What is special about the exclusion zone is its larger than average size and its low human population density. That's it. Nature needs space. When considering the large rates of land abandonment in Europe and the opportunity this brings to rewilding and to conservation, we can use this knowledge extracted from the Chernobyl example to make sure we are assigning large enough chunks of land to nature so that it's big enough to be meaningful. And also that we make sure that the population density in these areas is also low enough. Finally, this example also allows us to remember that sometimes we should simply let nature be and it will heal itself. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, a like would be most welcome. And if you have any questions or comments, please be sure to drop them in the comment section as we love to hear from you. At Mossy Earth, we work with rewilding and reforestation and we do our best to bring back wild ecosystems. So if that's something that you're curious about, be sure to check out the link in the description and maybe sign up to our membership. Cheers!